that's the lesson that you take from this. Don't ever, ever, ever give up on someone. When it comes down to it, it's a very difficult sport. I enjoy the, the people that are here. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Welcome to Community Close-Up, I'm Joe Nelson. Today we meet some four-legged friends specially trained to help those in need. We follow a Coon Rapids distance runner who just took on the toughest race of his life. And we find out how the quest to catch more fish is bringing many anglers off the water. But first, the year Coon Rapids became a city is the same year a grocery store worker decided to open up his own market. 57 years later, Jensen's Food still offers fresh produce, baked goods, and smiles. We take a look back and ahead at the store and what keeps it going strong. The community needs a little business like us. Anchoring the Northdale Shopping Center in Coon Rapids, Jensen's Foods has been feeding the neighborhood for more than half a century. I like the business and went to school and decided I wanted to have some supermarkets. George Jensen opened the store on Northdale Boulevard in 1959 after working at his parents' grocery store in Golden Valley. A man was developing the houses around here, the Orrin Thompson houses, and he saved this corner for a commercial. We said, yep, yeah, we'll take it. George's daughter, Jennifer, learned valuable lessons in these aisles. I grew up in the grocery store. My dad put me to work at a very young age. After selling the place in the 80s, things went downhill at the store. The previous owners had been picketed and um, the business had dwindled down to nothing. So we thought it was a great opportunity to come in, start over, start fresh, and, and, and build a new store. Jennifer Washburn and then-husband Corbin Washburn took over the store in 1991, renaming it Jensen's Foods. I've been working hard in the business for a long time, and it was great to bring the name back into the community again um, and, and reestablish that connection. Yeah, there was a lot of challenges, you know, the sales were like zero and uh, the really the biggest challenge was to make a living, <laughs> you know. Jennifer and Corbin found customers were in the market for more than what Jensen's had offered. Slowly, we added all the different departments back into the store. We added our bakery department back, which is a great draw. We added on our deli, which has been um, wonderful, and then full circle to a meat department as well. We wanted to bring it back, and I'm all about uh, fresh, and I have to have it be just so. Oh, our homemade pickles that we make are the best in the world. Uh, I'm biased, of course, you know, but they're really good. You know, a lot of our bakery products are caramel croissants. I'm sure you've heard about those from other people, maybe even tried them, you know. You should if you don't, you know, <laughs> if you haven't. Our potato salad's homemade. It's my mom's recipe. The banana bread's my recipe. So we have a lot of specialty items. You go look at the case out there. Not too many people around here, especially in the metro area, cut, do this kind of meat cutting anymore. A lot of personal service and uh, very excellent foods, and people like both of them. Basically, you're getting steak and chuck roast for your ground beef, straight up. So yeah, we're old fashioned. We always will be, I hope. Although he's no longer the owner, George still offers a helping hand. He's just turned 80, and um, he still comes to the store nearly every day and checks up on us. George helps us all the time. My daughter bought it back, and uh, I told her, I'd help her. He goes to the farmer's market for us just about every morning in the summertime and brings in all the fresh produce. We have almost like a little farmer's market in the front of our store. I just say, yay, George, thanks, you know. <laughs> He's just been such a great influence on us and has guided us through this, this journey. He's shared tips to be successful in the business. Lots of hard work, absolutely. We're, you know, very much hands-on. Customer service, yep. very important. He's okay. definitely taught me that through the years. I've been here for 55, six years, and uh, I know lots and lots of the customers. Hundreds of employees have come and gone over the years, but a few stand out. I had twin brothers running the meat department. Yeah, they even looked alike. I couldn't tell them. In fact, I hired, I hired the one brother uh, to run the meat department, and that afternoon, uh, I didn't know it was his twin, but. This fellow came in and he just looked like the guy I hired in the morning. And uh, it was his twin brother. <laughs> we had both of them working here and uh, <laughs> it was kind of fun. <clears throat> and they were both very excellent meat people and uh, that was uh, a highlight in the store. I do remember uh, Ike and Mike in the meat department, the butchers. They were um, 
They were quite the draw to our meat department, and now we've got Jimmy and John back in. So that's, that's kind of a great memory, is to have the, the brothers back in the meat department. Sure do. Right, John and Jim. Opportunity came up to get John in the store we had in St. Francis, and uh, we hired Jim. So we had the two brothers. Uh, these are orders for the senior citizens in Anoka, like the Oaks and all them senior buildings. John and Jim Lusher share more in common than just the space where Mike and Ike Rhodes once worked. The meat cutters were two brothers, yeah. Mike and Ike. Yeah. And we had a store in Anoka, and uh, Ike's the one who taught Jimmy how to cut meat. Yep. Then he worked for us years later. Corbin and Jennifer maintain and grow the store by sticking to their own strengths to keep refrigerators full. We have a great balance. He, um, he's always been the operational manager and I've taken care of the administrative work and the bookkeeping. So that works well, so we have our, our uh, separate titles and yet we work well together. A new Cub Foods grocery store is on the way, moving just nine blocks from Jensen's threatening business. Think about it all the time. You know, we, we can only hope, that's all. We can just hope that we got enough loyal customers and, you know, i am always been a small store guy. Always gonna have a concern, but we'll just have to wait and see and, and then just play forward after that. That's all you can do and, you know, take care of your customer. That's number one. We'll probably still be okay, you know. I'm sure uh, people are gonna go check it out at first, but, uh, I'm thinking they'll maybe come back to us, you know, we're more specialty and home, you know, family oriented store and I don't know, we'll see how it goes, you know. People come back for our, our quality product that we offer, you know, and, and a fair price. I've been here for what, 50 some years and uh, somebody comes in about every four or five years and builds a big store uh, and we've been able to survive and Hopefully we can survive this too. We know most of our customers and they support us and uh, we give a lot of personal service and just has worked out pretty good and I'm hoping it'll still work out good. I know they're going to take some of our, our grocery business but we think we have enough specialty business in our bakery and deli and meat that will retain our customers. They're pretty loyal so and we really appreciate that. You know, you get into the big stores, you become a number. At least here you can show your abilities and your quality. You get to work with the customer. You know, we'll always be old fashioned that way. The future of Jensen's is unknown, but George and his family hope to remain an important part of keeping their neighbors happy and not hungry after each visit. I don't really care whether my name is attached to the store. I care about how the store is run and uh, how we still treat the customers. I say we, it isn't my store at all. It's my daughter's store and her ex-husband. And uh, they get along good and uh, run a nice store and they like the business and think the personnel that works here. They're uh, so wonderful and know the customers so well and uh, we really take care of the customers personally because uh, that something everybody likes and you don't get it in hardly any store you can go to the big stores and sure they got more product but uh, there's nobody to help more than anything we've held our own and maintained our business and survived through it all so i think we'll survive through this next oh thank you i'm good thank you Great. have a good day we just appreciate the people of coon Rapids so much uh, they've supported us and helped us over all the years and uh, all the people that have worked here um, have been so fantastic. And, uh, it's really the people that have worked here that have created this business, uh, not me. I, um, I've just been here. <laughs> Jensen's is open every day from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. located on Northdale Boulevard and Juniper Street. Coming up, we find out how man's best friend can do much more than fetch or sit. Stay with us.
A Minnesota-based nonprofit organization has been pairing man with man's best friend for 27 years to help those who need assistance. Candu Canines of New Hope has been offering assistance dogs to people with disabilities free of charge. Community Close-Up's Jordan Rylance explains how a woman is welcoming a Candu Canine into her home and her heart. A four-year-old black poodle named Fred loves playing ball, eating treats, and hogging the camera. But Fred is much more than a companion to 29-year-old Stephanie Anderson. You know, I have hearing loss, and I found it to, uh, you know, very scary to be home alone um, when my husband wasn't here. And I wanted that security and that safety um, that comes with having a dog here, you know. But the world hasn't always been so quiet for Stephanie. I got sick with meningitis could hear one day, next day I couldn't. Stephanie began losing her hearing at the age of 12. A cochlear implant has helped Stephanie with her hearing loss, but her four-legged friend has brought her independence. I was always nervous about the fire alarm going off in the middle of the night or someone knocking on the door and I wouldn't notice. So I decided to apply for an assistance dog to kind of fill that gap in my hearing, my hearing loss. Oh, good boy. Fred has been specially raised and trained to help Stephanie identify noises she has a difficult time hearing. What? Oh, is someone here? That training came from Can Do Canines, a nonprofit organization in New Hope dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for people with disabilities by creating mutually beneficial partnerships with specially trained dogs. Founder and executive director of Kendu Canines, Alan Peters, found himself in his 30s looking for a career change. I started looking for a way to combine my interest and my love of dogs with that, that goal of giving something back to the community and discovered that there was a need for hearing dogs here in Minnesota, but that nobody was training them locally and consequently there was no way to get one if you were deaf or hard of hearing here in Minnesota. So it was with that in mind that I started the organization and we've built it up since then. Can Do Canines certified their first assistance dog in August of 1989. Then in 2007, the organization became a fully accredited member of Assistance Dogs International to ensure the dogs were meeting the highest of standards. Can Do Canines provides mobility, hearing, seizure, autism, and diabetes assist dogs. Each animal is specifically trained to understand how they can help those living with disabilities like Leslie Flowers' son, who has cerebral palsy and lives with a Kendu canine. I wanted to give back. I wanted to let other people have this opportunity that my son did. And so we started puppy raising, and we got super involved very quickly. At one time, we were raising three dogs <laughs> for the program at the same time. Making life more livable is something Kendu canines prides itself on, using dogs to give back independence to children and adults. So if somebody's at the door knocking, you take them to the front door. If the phone's ringing, you take them to the phone. If it's a smoke detector, they leave them out of the home. These dogs are also lifesavers, literally. The diabetes assist dogs are trained to smell the breath of a diabetic and determine if their blood sugar is too low. And autism assist dogs will lead children away from danger. Good boy. It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> Dee Hollerud is a puppy raiser. She cares for the dogs in her own home until they are ready to be placed with a new owner. There you go. Hardest part is the part of giving them up. And everybody says, how do you do that? How can you give them up? Well, it's really hard, but then you get to go to graduation and see who he got matched with and how they change lives. Stephanie Anderson's life is changing in a big way, thanks to Fred and a baby who will be born <laughs> later this month. Well, I'm hoping that we can train Fred to respond to the babies so when I can't hear, for example, middle of the night crying, um, Fred will let me know and he'll let me, he'll just tap me, let me know that the baby is making noise and I gotta go respond to that. Can do canine dogs would cost a client about $25,000 after training, Try again. but the organization Button. places every dog there. free of charge. There is no way we could have afforded a $25,000 dog. Like, there's just no way. But since its inception, Can Do Canines has placed nearly 500 assistance dogs throughout Minnesota, giving people like Stephanie some solace in an otherwise silent world. He's so needed, and he's <laughs> added so much to my life. For Community Close-Up, I'm Jordan Rylance.
Can Do Canines is always looking for volunteers. For more information, go to their website or give them a call. We meet a man who attempted to run a race that spans further than a trip from Coon Rapids to Brainerd in less than two days. How he fared up next. Can you help me with this? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Sure. He helps me with homework. That would be 3.6795. Thanks. Yep. He helps me with my decision making. I wouldn't use this one. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. I'm learning so much. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. The Twin Cities Marathon is coming up in October where thousands of men and women will pace through 26.2 miles to reach their goal times or just to finish. But one competitive distance runner in Coon Rapids is skipping that race with even bigger goals in mind. I've run pretty much my whole life, uh, high school and college. The pinnacle of competitive distance running for most ends at the 26.2 mile mark, the length of a marathon race. During his time competing in the sport, Bob Garens of Coon Rapids learned of races with finish lines much farther away. When I look back and at their uh, older results, they never got 50% of the people that started to finish and they had like 800 runners and I'm going, well, let's, let's do this. And so I, I didn't tell anybody I was thinking about this, I'm going to do a 100 mile race. And so I figured out a plan in my head, what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to be the one at the finish line mopping him up after he, he tried to complete something like that. Bob made it through his first 100 mile race in 2012 and found more each year. Looking for an even greater challenge outside of Minnesota's flat terrain, he found it. People say, what, why are you doing 100 mile? What are you doing? Why are you going to do another one? Not, you already finished one. I almost feel like I'm still kind of testing myself and seeing where the, where the limits are. The Hard Rock 100 is a 100 mile course that features steep climbs into elevations reaching more than 14,000 feet. That's a lot of mountain climbing. Obviously the first goal is to finish it. My speed goal was to be able to finish before the sun went down on the second day. Runners who don't finish the race in 48 hours don't get a time and are labeled DNF for did not finish. Bob's training intensified. And every month I had goal mileage and the next month would be a little further, a little further, a little further. You know that it's going to pay off in the end when you're out there and you're tired and you've, you've, you've put in your miles, you lifted your weights, uh, you've done those. Uh, long workouts like we were we put together workouts for 12 hour workout or 18 hour workout to simulate being awake for that long. We all start together in one mass in this little town of Silverton and it was more or less on a gravel road and we just headed off into the mountains. Reaching high elevations challenged Bob and the rest of the runners throughout the course. Once I started getting up over 13,000 feet, the oxygen is just lower and you, your body just naturally starts slowing down especially when you're not acclimated to that. Through the two full days, he spent only 200 minutes resting. At an aid station, they'll have water, they'll have foods. At night, they have coffee. They, they, this one had a lot of opportunities to eat there. Bob returned to the course and battled tired feet and an exhausted mind. You slow down at night, things get cold, uh, it, the temperature drops in the mountains. You know, after 24 hours, you're, you know, you're getting tired and your mind's going, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to stop and you just got to learn just to to stick with it and trust your people to help you keep moving along. You think about a lot of things. You think about remodeling your house. You think about uh, maybe I should not, tr you know, I should take a couple months off from training and spend time with the family. There's, you, uh, and after, <laughs> after about 50 miles, you start rethinking the same things over and over again. One distraction is the beauty of their surroundings. You can see snow-capped mountains all around you and we came up and went right over the top and down the other side. After the halfway point, friends Gary Lamott and Greg Lecheski of Coon Rapids were able to join Bob on his journey toward the finish line. At a 50 mile mark in most 100 mile races, you can pick up a pacer. As soon as you pick up a pacer, then there, there's other things to think about. You could talk with somebody and they can help you keep your mind on other, other things besides your sore feet. I went into it with the attitude of, of whatever uh, he asked of me to, to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability to help him be successful in his goal of finishing the hard rock. We started out in the town of Bore, which was um, at seven and a half thousand feet, and uh, six miles later we were at 13,000 feet. Bob's crew chief and wife, Sue Garens, waited at aid stations to supply Bob with calories, care, and encouragement. Oh, there's always usually a kiss before he leaves the aid station. Um, 
but he was pretty positive in this race um, for the most part, you know, except maybe right before that last nine, 10 mile stretch. But um, basically I just told him, well, you know, quitting isn't an option. So, and you know that, and he would be so disappointed if, if we did let him quit. So it wasn't too big of an issue. I, I did uh, have the pleasure of taking Bob into the finish on this one. We started at uh, mile 91 and we had, uh, eight hours to do nine miles. So, I, you know, the last thing Sue said to me as we took off is, is make sure you get him in on time, make sure he finishes. After 44 hours and 46 minutes, putting one foot in front of the other, up and down the San Juan Mountains, Bob finished the race more than three hours ahead of his goal. I just helped get him there, but uh, watching my friend uh, you know, complete this incredible goal was, was uh, very satisfying and, and happy to be a part of it. It felt really cool, especially to be a part of it part of everything like that and see all the people that were there and just to be out there was really neat. It was so exciting to finish and what they have is they have a big rock with a, with the, the uh, logo of the uh, event on there and you come in and you kiss the rock and it's just just a relief to stop running and be able to complete something like that within the allotted time especially when you're not yeah, that's not even your environment that's not where you live you live in flat country knowing that this is pretty much the hardest 100 mile race in the country um, and it's been a goal of his for a few years and the fact that he got picked from a small lottery of people and was able to go out there and finish it was pretty special this was my 10th 100 mile race um, i ran my first one in 2012 and then since then uh, I've just done a couple a year. Greg and Gary, who ran with Bob for much of the race, have seen the benefits too. After uh, meeting Bob and, and seeing him run the 100 mile distance, I actually jumped to a 50 mile. I got a, my first 100 coming up in 28 days. Climbing up and down the mountains for from three in the morning till nine at night, that one day probably a lot of times on my feet and climbing up and down probably helped out. He does offer encouragement to anyone with fitness or distance running goals in mind. Just like somebody else likes to bike or swim, I like to run and uh, there's just that freedom out there. It's a stress relief and when you're just starting it out, start out slow. You know, do a couple days a week and figure it out. Don't go too hard. For one thing, you're going to be sore and you have to get through that soreness to really start appreciating what the benefits are. If you quit after you get sore, then it, it, you're just going to be in that sort of cycle. Typical response is, I don't even like to drive that far. People just think it's crazy. And on the outset, I guess it is. But when you get into it and start training and realizing that it's actually attainable, it's pretty good. But I'd encourage anybody to come out and do it. It's, it's a great way to stay fit. Just go in with a positive attitude, knowing that, you know, if I go out and I say I want to do uh, three runs this week, but I only get two in, don't say, oh, I'm a failure. I'm not going to get this program. Just go out the next week and get your three runs. And then after three weeks, go four runs or something like that. But start into it slow, and, but with a positive attitude that you're just going to build up as you go along. There are even longer races like the Fat Dog in Canada that extends to 120 miles. But Bob says he has no plans to go past 100. Still to come, we find out how a basement hobby turned into a fast-growing business to help anglers catch more fish. Stay with us. I think my purse is upstairs on the bed. It's not here. Check the dining room. No. What about your sister's room? It's not there either. The upstairs closet? The downstairs closet. There are no more closets. <laughs> Moms everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Thanks for watching Community Close Up. We'll leave you at Tuned Up Custom Rods, a Coon Rapids family business that's seen its rods go from a basement shop to fishing shows and magazines in just a few years. I'm Joe Nelson. We'll see you next time. I fish a lot of tournaments, so I'm fishing almost every weekend on different lakes. An avid angler, Mitchell DeMorit of St. Francis, knows a good rod and reel from a bad one. This is the Apex, medium heavy. It's best for when I mean, you're fishing heavy cover you know, thick grass. The rods he uses aren't made in China or even outside of Anoka County. To reel in a lunker, Mitchell uses tuned up custom rods built on Coon Rapids Boulevard next to Average Joe's Archery. 
for its CEO, John Burback. It started as a hobby. Well, about 16 years ago, I started building ice rods for um, myself, and then I kind of got into building them for buddies, and then pretty soon, um, a couple of years later, I was building them for customers and, and kind of building them on my own, and yeah. then I built open water rods, put me through college. I built me one for my birthday, and me being the entrepreneur that I am, I thought, how can we get into this? And I said, John, we can do this. Why don't we give it a try? John started building more ice rods and selling them at fishing shows and out of his Coon Rapids basement. But that business plan didn't last long. Basically, it was my wife said, we need to move it out of here because there was customers every night. It was busy. So we moved it to a, a local shop, and then now we're in our new facility. Um, so it's, it's grown exponentially over the last few years. Rods are customized by length, color, and handle, and cater to the specific fish species and size each angler is looking to hook. You get a guy who's was so, you know, I want to I catch a... a 13 pound walleye and it's like yep here's the rod you're going to use it'll handle it just fine. I bought my first ice rod about four years ago and I've been hooked ever since. We do a lot of trial and error uh, research and development which is a good excuse for me to go out and go fishing. Each rod takes a few days to finish the customization and drying process but a long line of orders requires fishermen to be more patient. I don't remember the last time that we were actually caught up because I don't believe we've ever been caught up. To me, if we've got a backlog, that means we're doing something right. Word is spreading among anglers seeing tuned up rods featured on fishing shows, in magazines, and being used by pros, growing demand. You sit back and watch on Sunday morning and you go, man, I made that, or hey, there's the logo that, that, uh, that we came up with, and it, it's just, it's a very cool feeling to see that. John and his brother-in-law and business partner Adam Audette found a convenient solution to add staff. It's a rule of like five. Once you've been here about five times, um, you end up being an employee after a while just because you're you're here so often and you kind of get stuck. Um, we, it's funny because people will get so busy and they'll be like, oh, what can I help out with? We'll just put them to work. And next night they come in, they're like, well, here's your job. So it, it works out really well. Bought a custom rod from them and just because I wanted to, you know, wanted to try it, they seemed really nice. And, and then came back for another one and, and then uh, haven't left. I just kept going there and, and talking to him. And then one day I just asked, I talked to Adam and I was, you know, if you need an extra guy, because I knew they were, they were you know, hook, looking for help. They now see their handiwork sold at much larger stores like Shields and soon Cabela's. It's cool to walk through a store and see your product on the shelf. Adam and John say the rods are made with strong materials and are customized in a way that anglers can better sense where the fish are. Your return on investment on a $100 rod, 10 bucks a year. A lot of guys will buy a $15 rod every year for 10 years, and you're better off spending the money once. They can feel uh, the bottom uh, of the lake. They can feel the suction of the mud. They can feel the smallest little fish biting away at their rod. To me, that's awesome. If you want to catch more fish, and I know it sounds crazy, but they will actually catch more fish. A higher end rod is using higher end components, which makes that rod more sensitive. The more fish that you feel, the more fish you're going to catch. The staff ranges in age from high school students to retirees, and many are family members. My dad retired a few years ago, and he had helped us out a little bit in the basement uh, and doing doing some things. And and well, as he was still working, and once he retired, my mom said, "You guys have got to find him something to do because he is driving me crazy." He gave me something to do. So now dad comes in. And dad spends the most time here than anybody. At the end of the day, um, business is business, but family is is the most important thing. I just love to see it, see it all come out, you know, see him uh, get popular, I, I just love it. And it's, it's kind of a family ordeal. He's very picky, detail oriented, uh, and uh, he, you know, he, he's kind of the jack of all trades here. A friend of mine will order a rod for me, he goes, I want you to make it, I want you to wrap it. Well then, when I give it to him, here you go, that's a good feeling. And then when I, when I hear him say, yeah, yeah, you know, I caught all, the, all this fish and had a blast with it, you know, it, it's, it's just a good feeling. My favorite thing to do is fish, so why not go build fishing rods and then be able to use my own thing I've built, you know? It's just that last cast, you never know. It could be the one that you've been waiting for for all your life.